Dennis Gempo Merzel. Um, the title is Roshi or Zen Master. It happened back in February of 1971, and I was having some difficulties in my relationship with the woman I was living with, and I decided to go out in the desert with two of my friends uh, to get a little space for three days. And they walked off uh, to do a hike together. They were a couple. And so I was left alone. I hiked to the top of a mountain. Uh, this is in the Mojave Desert in California, near Jawbone Canyon. And I was sitting there on top of this mountain, and I was contemplating my life and how could I have screwed up my life so badly. I'm only 26 years old. I'd already been divorced. I was in a new relationship. The relationship seemed perfect. And I started to feel the same suffocation, the same feeling of being trapped and being bound, uh, and not free, not liberated. And so I was sitting there contemplating on what is this all about. And what came up, was, and it was very spontaneous, was a question. I don't know where it came from, but from deep within me. And the question was, well, where is home? So I began to, and I, I was not a meditator, I never meditated before, but I began to really contemplate or meditate as I was sitting there in a cross-legged Indian fashion, uh, this question, and I had a spontaneous awakening, and body-mind dropped off, uh, I became one with the cosmos, I, um, I lost the self, dropped the self, and had an experience of being one with all, all things, the whole. And it was such a, an abrupt and immediate experience that was so transformative, I knew from that moment I would never be the same again. And I saw that my life up to that moment had all been pushing forward, going ahead full steam, whether it be as an athlete, I was a, a swimmer, an all-American water polo player, I played uh, in the Maccabean Games in Israel in 1965, my college teams, three out of four were champion, American champion or state championship teams. Uh, everything was about winning, about gain, about fame, about security. I'd already got a master's degree. Uh, I was already had tenure in my, my work. I was teaching school. And all of a sudden, that all seemed very empty, very meaningless. And the only thing that seemed to really matter at that point was to continue to wake up, to continue to clarify uh, what this life really is, and to really share that with others. So I began immediately sharing it with my friends, and anybody who was ready to listen, I went back to teaching on Monday, I shared it with my team teacher, shared it with the kids, I mean, I taught them how to meditate, and I hadn't, hadn't ever had any instruction. But from that experience, I learned how to sit still, do nothing, and be quiet. Well, you know, I've, I've trained uh, 37 years now, 38 years, um, and became a Zen master in 1996. I was given the, uh, what we call Inca, final seal of approval. Uh, I became a successor of my late teacher, my Zumi Roshi, in 1980, and I began training with him in 1972. And we went through a series of what's called koan study. These koans are questions that are difficult to answer and impossible to answer with the rational mind. You must uh, transcend the rational or the dualistic mind and go into a non-dual or transcendent state, which I had already experienced back in 71. So the koans were relatively easy for me, and I went through them uh, rather quickly. In fact, in six years, I went through over 700 of them uh, and became his second uh, student to complete the Kohan study and his second successor. I would say it's all out there. The, the possibilities, the availabilities technologically uh, are all out there. Choose wisely uh, and that you really can wake up. I mean, it, it is really possible it's not that difficult to wake up. The following up, the follow-up to waking up, the, the practice, the, 
embodiment of that, the integration of that into your life, fulfilling your life, that part is not so easy. I mean, I would say practice at least maybe 30 minutes a day of meditation. Uh, I'd say there are other technologies out there that one could practice. Uh, if you, one is really serious, just like if you're really serious to study a musical instrument, it might be advisable to find a great teacher uh, to work with someone who can help you because one of the things that we know about our ego is our ego is very cunning, it's very conniving, it's very tricky and the ego will every time fool us and sometimes we need a good friend or a good partner or a good teacher to kind of you know help us see where we're stuck, where we're being blind. I myself need that all the time because I know my ability to delude myself is infinite and we sometimes just need to check things out with another and be open, be receptive, and be willing to hear and to listen to what they have to say uh, and not get defensive. Uh, but I'd say it's all there and it's possible and anyone can do it. Anyone can lead an awakened life that's full of love and compassion. It's not that difficult. I would say you could call it a religion. Uh, I don't particularly see it so much as a religion, but you could call it a religion. It's more spirituality or even more precisely, it's a way of life. It's a way to be in the world, uh, to come from wisdom, to act with compassion and love. And uh, in doing that, uh, to really be a kinder, nicer, uh, more empathetic, compassionate person in the world. Uh, and it's less about rules and it's less about dogma than it is about a way to live one's life uh, connected and seeing the interconnectedness to all, all beings. No, and in fact, I was raised agnostic uh, by my father and I was raised as an atheist by my mother. Uh, and I don't believe in a, particularly in an external God. Uh, I believe God, but to me God is the same as what I call Big Mind, which is what the title of my latest book is, Big Mind, Big Heart. It's also the title of the work that I do. Big Mind is when someone allows themselves to identify with the mind that has no boundaries, no limits, uh, has no beginning, no end, there's no birth, there's no death. That's the infinite, that's the eternal, that's what we would call God, it's the absolute. But I don't give it the name usually as God, although we can. Uh, I just call it Big Mind and Big Heart. Big Mind is obviously opening our mind to the infinite. Just opening our consciousness to the infinite. It, again, I can use best the triangle. So if the left-hand side of the triangle is the more restricted mind and heart, the, the, the mind and heart that we encase and we call that the self. It's, it's limited, it's finite, um, it's, it's contained in, in our story, who I think I am, who I believe I am, uh, you know, what I would call Gempo. Okay, that's the small mind. All this in this body, what goes on here and in my thoughts, my beliefs, my concepts, my opinions, my ideas, my notions about who I am. Okay, that's the limited, that's the left-hand side. On the other side, big mind is when you throw all that out, when you drop all that, when you drop all the concepts, all the ideas, all the notions of who I am, all the, the story about it, and then I'm in that wonder, in that transcendent state where I just don't know who I am. I'm so big, but there's no one there to know. There's no subject-object division. There's no one there to say, oh, I am this. There's no hearer, there's no listener, there's no seer. I am all, I am the whole, I am the infinite, I am the eternal. That's big mind. What we could call the absolute, what we could call God. Big heart is the apex. Big heart is when we combine or we include all the personal, the limited self, the small mind, the confined or limited mind, and the big mind, out of the wisdom of big mind and the conventional wisdom of the limited self, we move to the apex, and that's big heart. We open our heart up 
to its limitless capacity, its unconditional love and caring. It's unconditional. At this point, my love for all sentient beings, my love for all inanimate as well as animate, for all, all things and all beings, for the planet, it is so beyond anything I can conceive of or imagine because it's beyond imagination, it's beyond conception. It's so open. But because it's balanced with big mind, because there's that balance, I can care infinitely. I can, compare, I can care without conditions, unconditionally. That's big heart. And then we take these two into our daily life and we function with wisdom and compassion. That's big heart, big mind. Like all technologies, uh, spiritual technologies, we're advancing. And for 2,500 years, what has eluded us in the spiritual practice, in the spiritual world, and Zen is also known as the sudden school uh, of Buddhism, and it's probably the most sudden and immediate path. Most of the paths are more gradual, but Zen has always uh, called itself the, the instant awakening, the sudden awakening, that in one moment we can have a sudden realization or a sudden awakening, like happened to me in February of 71, and it's, you know, it's happened many, many times, and to many spiritual practices it's happened. But what has eluded us is how do you get someone to wake up? So we have something what's called a turning word. So if the student is really ripe, kind of like a chick and an egg, and the chick is really ready to be born, the mother hen will peck at that shell and crack it open. But if she cracks it too soon, the chick dies because the chick's not fully developed. If she cracks it too late, the chick also will die. So the mother hen, the timing is absolutely essential. So a, a turning word is to peck on that shell at just the right moment when the student is ready to awaken. And that's always been an art. It's always been something that, that a master has to be totally tuned in to the disciple in order to help them awaken and say just the right thing. So like one of those was a, a monk came to the great master Joshu and said, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Joshu just said, moo. And moo is not the sound of a cow. It was actually in Chinese, it was woo, woo, like that. And the student opened up, the student awakened. Another one um, was, uh, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma? Bodhidharma was the great master who came from India and brought Zen from, or Buddhism from India to China, and that became Zen. So the question is, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? And Joshu said, the oak tree in the garden. And at that moment, he was probably looking out at this oak tree, and the student looked out at this oak tree and had an opening had an experience. So we've been able to bring students to a sudden realization, but it was never, it was never uh, that we could determine the moment, the, the, the time and the place. Everything had to be just right. The, the soil had to be just prepared. What Big Mind, the technology of Big Mind is that we can do it with 400 people in an audience. We can do it with 10,000 people over the TV screen uh, or the computer screen. We can do it with millions of people, and we can determine when we do it, because all it requires, and this is all it requires, is that the person is prepared and wants to open up and has just enough trust to follow the directions. So like at this moment, if I was to say to you, may I speak to Big Mind, please? May I speak to Big Mind? And then as the listener says, okay, I am Big Mind. And then take a moment to just reflect who you are. I'm no longer Gempo. I'm no longer Dennis Merzel. Now I am Big Mind. And then when we look in to our mind, we see as Big Mind, I can find no birth, no beginning. I can find no limit. I find no end. I find no parameters, no edges. My mind is infinite, eternal, and there's no Genpo. There's no self. And that is technology, <laughs> because we've never been able to do that before. 
10 years ago, almost exactly, it was 10 years ago, June, that I discovered Big Mind. And since then, hundreds of thousands of people have awakened either through workshops or DVDs or the internet or YouTube uh, with this process. Because the technology, not only the technical technology is there, but the spiritual technology is there. Because by asking to speak to this voice, once I identify that I am it, then all the wisdom of the voice is there. So I can also ask to speak to the awakened mind. May I please speak to the awakened mind? And then I say, okay, who are you? I'm the awakened mind. Well, who are you not? Well, I'm not the non-awakened mind. I'm not the unawakened mind. I'm not the mind that is deluded. I am the awakened mind. So what are you? I'm awake. What does that mean? You're awake. I'm awake. I'm conscious. Well, what are you conscious of? This. What's going on right here now? What, my surroundings? Watching this interview? I'm awake. Well, what's different now than before? Well, now I realize I'm awake. I didn't know I was awake before. I am awake. What does that mean? Well, my whole life just changed. I am an awakened being. Well, what does that mean? I am a Buddha. If we use the, those terms, I am an awakened one. When the Buddha was asked, who are you? He said, I'm sorry, but that's the wrong question. So the questioner said, well, what's the right question, the correct question? He said, what are you? So the person said, well, okay, what are you? He said, I'm awake. One thing that I think we know and I have found out it's really important to spend some time alone and some time to really contemplate our life. Uh, one of the things that we know are really self-actualizing individuals, and Maslow found this out a long time ago, have one thing in common, and that very thing in common that every self-actualizing person that he studied had in common is they spend a minimum of maybe an hour a day alone, either in meditation or prayer, walking on a, on a path or a road uh, alone in the forest, in the mountains, sitting by a stream or by a fireplace, or maybe just listening to music. So I think it's important for us to be really sincere and honest with ourselves and spend some time, some uh, quality time with ourselves and reflecting. I also think that it's important for us to be willing to experience our emotions, our feelings, to experience our heart. Uh, and not suppress or disown aspects of ourself. Of course, the, the major reason is craving and attachment. Those were discovered by the Buddha 2,500 years ago. We all have cravings and attachments. Uh, but let me give it a little twist, a little spin, something that uh, I think might be really helpful for those viewing this. And that is, think about how much you care. Just think about that for a moment. How much you care, you care about, of course, your own life, your children, your family, your loved ones, you care about your wife or your husband, you care about your parents, uh, you care about the world, you care about the planet, you care about the future of the planet. Just think of how much you care. And we, we usually think, well, maybe I don't care enough. Maybe I should care more, and that's true. All of us could care more. But we also don't look at that caring as maybe an attachment. I care so much that I'm actually binding myself without even a rope. Because I am so caring, I am so loving towards others, and of course I could be more, but that binds me because out of this caring, what I'm not doing is being free. Then think of that as the left-hand side of, of the triangle again, and think about that caring as an attachment, as a craving. I crave to care more. I'm attached to uh, maybe satisfying my partner, or fulfilling my mother, or making my husband happy, or being there for another. I care so much that I'm all frustrated, 
I feel disappointment. I, I feel maybe uh, guilty that I, I don't do enough. I'm not there enough. Then take the other side of the triangle. Let's just shift to the other side of the triangle, the base of the triangle, where I don't care. I'm not attached. I let go. I drop all that caring. And I have an attitude here, which could be quite immature, of not caring. But it could also be very mature that out of this not caring, I'm free to care more. But without it being a cause of suffering. In other words, if we take the right-hand side of the triangle as detachment or as liberation, nirvana, uh, these are all terms that we could use for the right hand, it's the transcendent. If we take the right-hand side of that triangle to be freedom from, freedom from attachment, freedom from craving, freedom from desire, freedom from fear, freedom from uh, all these things that bind me, and then at the apex, we see that on one hand, I deeply, deeply care about this world. I care about its future. I care about all the species on, the, on this planet, not just the human species. I, I not only care about the human and species, I care about the animate and inanimate things. I care about the rocks. I care about the seashells. I care about the sand on the beaches. I care, I care, I care. But because I've gone to the other extreme of the other side of the triangle, of not caring at all, I am free to care and still, in that caring, have a sense that I'm not overwhelmed by it, and I'm not uh, frustrated by it, and I'm not guilty about, about it all. So at the apex, it allows us to approach our life in a, a way that is fully functioning. In other words, I'm in touch with my deepest feelings and emotions, and yet I'm not particularly attached. There was a great poem by uh, two great Zen masters, and let me just share this with you. Uh, one of the masters was named Obaku, and he was one of the all-time great masters, and he had a great student named Rinzai. And in fact, two of the three schools in Japan of the Zen schools, one's the Soto school, the other's the Rinzai school, and the third, it's a smaller school, is the Obaku. So two of these characters, uh, uh, of these lineages were in this koan. And Rinzai was the young student, probably in his early 20s, and he was out working in the field and working hard all day. In those days, they did a, a, a lot of work in the field. He's coming back into the monastery, and his teacher's sitting there under a tree, all cool, cool, chilled out, you know, sitting there in meditation. And he sees the young monk coming in, and he says to him, hey, I see that you've been hard at it. You've been working hard. You're all sweaty and all that. And the young monk says, yes, but you should know the one who's not hard at it. And what he was doing in that response, and it was a beautiful response, he was demonstrating the triangle. So the teacher's talking about the left-hand side of the triangle. There's one who's working hard, who's efforting, who's trying, who's trying to become something or make something or provide something or do something. And the, the young monk, who was already very enlightened, said, but you should know the other side. Of course, his teacher knows the other side. But he says that. He said, you should know, meaning I'm also aware that there's one who's never hard at it. There's one who's always free. There's one who is not efforting and trying, who is at rest, at peace, in just being, in, in, in that state of mind. And I occupy both. I include, I embrace both as who I am. I'm hard at it, and yet there's one who's not hard at it. An enormous amount. <laughs> you know, I think we're coming to the place where we're realizing that so much of our illnesses, like I myself, I went through cancer. Uh, six years ago, I had a mouth cancer, a tumor uh, next to my uvula more than two centimeters and went through six weeks of radiation. And, and I think it was brought about by not getting enough rest. My, my, my immune system was really down. I had spent nearly 30 years getting up very early in the mornings, like 4.30 or 5, uh, and working all the way through uh, till late at night, living on maybe three, four hours of rest and sleep. And I think we know that, that stress, that not enough rest, 
uh, that meditation could allow us to truly rest and truly relax. Because I wasn't doing a whole lot of meditation. I was doing so much teaching at that point. Uh, in the earlier years, I did 10, 12 hours of meditation a day. Sometimes as long as nine months of the year, I was meditating 10, 12 hours a day. And all of a sudden, the past, I don't remember how long it was then, maybe 10 years, I was just teaching, teaching, teaching. So everything was going out. And I would have done well to do more meditation. I think what we can learn from Eastern practice, how to reduce the stress, how to reduce anxiety, how to reduce fear, and how to really truthfully relax, chill out. And the word nirvana uh, can be translated as chilled, or chilled out, or cool, or cool, uh, cooled off. You know, we're in that place where there's not a lot of stress, not a lot of pressure. So I think that's one thing. Another thing is the whole big mind, big heart process really allows us, like, what, the first thing I did when I got my cancer is I spoke to the tumor. Immediately I spoke to the tumor. I, I, I spent every night, an hour a night, and I would first talk to the tumor. I'd say, tumor, cancer, why are you here? And you know what the first thing it told me? Your life is out of balance. You're doing too much, and you're not spending enough time in meditation. You're not spending enough time in devotion. Your, your mind, all that you're doing here is trying to help people wake up, but it's too mental. And for all your, your Zen practice, the past almost 30 years, 35 years, was also very devotional. You kind of stopped doing the devotional part. My teacher had died in 95, and I'd stopped doing all that devotional practice, and I started doing too much mental. So the first thing the cancer told me, your life is not in tune. Your life is out of harmony. It's, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not at peace. And you must, you must start bringing back in more heart, more devotion. Up until that moment, I, didn't, I don't think I called it big mind, big heart. I just called it the big mind process. Now I generally, even though it's still the trademark is big mind, I say big mind, big heart, because I included the more devotional, the heart aspect more because that was out, out of whack. It was not in balance. The other thing it, it told me was that there were certain things in my life I had to stop doing. You know, One of them was I had to stop spending time doing things I didn't want to do. And I had to spend more time doing the things that I loved to do. The other thing it told me is you got to stop spending so much time with people you don't want to be around. People that are, you know, uh, maybe draining you, maybe demanding too much from you, and you're not happy in that relationship, stop spending so much time with people you don't really want to be with and start spending more time with the people you do want to be with. Now, when I'm with someone, they know I want to be with them. I'm not doing it out of some feeling of obligation or, or I should do this or I need to do this or I must do this. If I'm spending time with you, I want to be spending time with you. If I'm doing something, it's because this is what I really want to do. And what I found was the things that I loved to do the most were the things I had been doing, which is helping people wake up, help, helping people get in touch with some of the parts of themselves that, say, that are shadowed or disowned that will help them feel happier and more fulfilled in their life, getting in touch with things that are blocking their energy. The great Master Rinzai, who I mentioned earlier, once said at the later part of his life, this was like 50, 60 years later, he said, there are only two things that I do anymore in my teaching. I remove barriers and I untie knots. And sometimes our energy is all knotted up. It's like we need a good acupuncture needle right into the center of our uh, being. And I think Big Mind is that needle where we open ourselves up so that our energy is flowing again. The cancer told me this. My energy wasn't flowing well. Also, uh, we may have certain barriers, certain decisions maybe we made as children. Like I made a decision. And I only got in touch with this just recently. In fact, just I just had my 65th birthday two weeks, three weeks ago. And I had a, a, a very great liberation on my birthday. It was the greatest present I could have had. One of the things I got in touch with was in my relationship with my mother, I held a lot of guilt because I could never, ever make my mother happy or pleased, never satisfy her. And what I realized was I held this tremendous guilt that I could never live up to 
her expectations. And I've carried this into my life. What a liberation to realize and drop that. To realize that and to drop that and be free from that guilt of trying to make somebody else happy, to make somebody else fulfilled, to, to make somebody else feel satisfied in their life. That's their responsibility, and I can't do it anyways. So what a liberation. So at that moment, I also liberated all my students and all my successors. I wrote an email to my successors, and I have like 13 successors, and I wrote an email to them, and I said, you're now free. It is your dharma, your teaching that you're carrying on. It's no longer mine. And it's your responsibility. It's your life. And you're free. And who are you free from? Me. I'm setting you free. I'm cutting the umbilical cord. I'm kicking you out of the nest. And you're free to live your life and to spread the teachings, the dharma, however you see fit. And I'm not going to ask anything of you. Now, that could look like detachment, cop-out, I don't care. Right? Because that's where it came from. All of a sudden, I saw the me and the my, the I in this, the me in this, like my teachings, my dharma. And I was attached to that, that they do a good job in carrying that forward. And when I dropped the my and the me and the mine out of it, it became their dharma or the dharma, not mine, not the possessive. My wife, my husband, my children, my mother, my father. It's now they're all human beings and they're all people in their own right. And I don't own them. I don't possess them. Nor am I owned by them or possessed by them.